uh, on behalf of the Alice India collaboration, I welcome you all to this interesting uh, webinar today. So today it is our great pleasure to have with us Professor Raju Venugopalan from BNL USA. We are extremely thankful to Professor Raju for accepting our request and finding time for this talk. Thank you very much, Professor Raju, for joining in from USA in this cold winter so early in the morning. We all know Professor Raju very well, and he does not need any formal introduction to this audience. However, I will very briefly say a few words about him. So, Professor Raju Venugopalan is currently a senior scientist and group leader for the nuclear theory group at BNF. Professor Raju obtained his BS from University of Chicago and PhD from Stony Brook. He has held several faculty appointments in past, including Excellence Initiative Guest Professor and Chair at the Institute for Theoretical Physics at Heidelberg University, Germany during 2014 to 16. He was elected a Fellow of American Physical Society in 2007. Professor Venugopalan has received several prestigious awards, such as Fulbright Senior Specialist Award, mm -hmm. the Humboldt Research Award, the BNL Science and Technology Award, and very recently he received the Suffolk County New York Distinguished Asian American Award in 2019. So every year almost some awards. We all know that Professor Venugopalan is the man behind color glass condensate effective theory of quantum chromodynamics. And this work was just this year by Physical Review D as one of the 25 most influential papers in its history of 50 years. Professor Raju co-invented IP Glasma model and pioneered numerical and analytical techniques in real-time classical statistical field theory. He is the author of about 160 publications which have received nearly 21,000 citations. Today he will be talking about thermalization in QCD, theoretical approaches, phenomenological applications and interdisciplinary connections. Since this uh, webinar is the last webinar of this year, uh, which is to be conducted or which is being conducted by Alice India Collaboration. So be before inviting Professor Raju, I would request the spokesperson of Alice India Collaboration, Professor Subhashish Chattopadhyay, to say a few words and then we can start with the talk. Subhashish, mm -hmm. please. Uh, thank you, Siddharth. <coughs> uh, hi, Raju. Uh, hi, <laughs> uh, is it going in Brookhaven? Is it too cold? Is it uh, already snowing? I, I, I'm not at Brookhaven. I am at home. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's too early I, for today. I haven't, I haven't been to Brookhaven since March 13th. Ah, that's good. <laughs> anyway, so uh, thank you very much for agreeing. Uh, when we discussed with Siddharth that who should be our next speaker, then of course we kind of. Um, a little bit we had our own kind of thing that whether Raju will have time but then we were overjoyed when he agreed and gave us time uh, as uh, because we all remember the days when we had meeting in ECC in our office and of course uh, we had nice ICP KGP but then we, we were supposed to have ICP KGP in 2020 also uh, all the planning was done right. committee was formed Right. And then, you know, 2020 is not a normal year, so right. <laughs> everything else got kind of, and I'm sure, uh, because my, my main point is that the discussions which we had, uh, even with Prithish was there here, is basically to, it, you, you, you can generate excitement among the students. That's the main thing which I kind of like personally. Uh, because I remember the um, colorless condensate and then how to get the signatures of it and whether its correlation would be observable, etc. So that we all remember forever and then we have learned a lot from you. And in that sense, that's why I sent a special mail to my collaborators. 
that please don't miss it, whatever it may happen. <laughs> so I see a good number of uh, them. Of course, some of them are from USA itself. I see Devojit, for example, in Wayne State. He, has, he must have got up pretty early. Uh, so like that, there are many uh, kind of um, people who are waiting for you to listen. So I do not want to be in between you and uh, your talk. So uh, I thank you again. And uh, as Siddharth said, this is the last talk. Uh, we are having a kind of series. We have started a series like that. Uh, so you are kind of, I think, third or fourth speaker in that series. So we'll have next year again some more. Uh, but today we would like to enjoy. And uh, thanks a lot to you. So you may please start your presentation. Great. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to ask everyone to turn off their mics unless they have an, a question, which you're very welcome to to uh, interrupt me at any stage during my talk. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm really overwhelmed uh, and thankful for this uh, invitation and the kind words. Um, as Subhasha said, we're really living in a very uh, peculiar time. It's something we will tell our kids and maybe grandkids about um, in future. Um, as I mentioned, I haven't been to the office for nearly nine months, um, but it's been a fantastic time in a weird way for science. Um, it's been great to have the solitude uh, to think about uh, many things about nature. Uh, and so I want to uh, try and communicate some of my excitement uh, on some of the things that uh, you've been working very hard on um, in, in at least um, you know, and, and other uh, experimental collaborations uh, in trying to understand uh, from the experimental point of view. Uh, my goal today is to uh, talk to you about thermalization in quantum chromodynamics um, with um, some discussion of uh, ab initio theory, uh, how one thinks about its phenomenological applications and uh, and really numerous interdisciplinary connections that have since emerged um, it, with, ver with very different fields across energy scales. Uh, and I wanna give uh, some, some sense of that excitement as well. Now, this is of course only an hour long talk. Uh, it's however, based on a review I wrote with Jürgen Berges, Miha Heller and Alexas Mazelowskis. Uh, which is on the archive and which should appear in reviews of modern physics sometime um, early next year. Uh, so you can look into that for more details on some of the things I've been talking about here. Um, so the, the problem in having ion collisions is that you um, almost, uh, I'm sure nearly all of you have heard that uh, in heavy ion collisions, we create a nearly perfect fluid, a quark gluon plasma. Um, and the question that is, concomitant, which is of great interest, is how do we go from such a violent uh, nuclear collision where the initial state is very far from equilibrium uh, through some um, dynamical process whereby the final state resembles uh, a nearly perfect fluid? In other words, what is the thermalization process as a function of time in heavy ion collisions? Um, so this is... Um, a very difficult question in, uh, in, in, in quantum field theory. So um, it's a very complex system with uh, many, many aspects to it, uh, many moving parts. Uh, and thermalization is a problem in quantum field theory, even for very simple systems. So um, there's lots of work going on in statistical mechanics and uh, in chemistry and condensed matter physics, trying to understand thermalization, even in small systems and uh, that often turns to be uh, also to be elusive. Um, so in, in, a, in a system like um, a heavy ion event, where you produce thousands of collisions uh, uh, producing, I'm uh, sorry, I mean, thousands of particles are produced, uh, which are subatomic and uh, measure in your giant detectors. Uh, how do we actually make sense of all of this? So um, it's not hopeless, <laughs> uh, we have, we are fortunate to have a fundamental theory which describes what goes on. That's quantum chromodynamics. It's a theory with nearly no parameters in it, fundamentally. So that's something that we possess. Uh, we also have 
remarkable phenomenology from a range of heavy mine experiments um, that have been conducted uh, over decades now along uh, across a, a wide range of energies. Uh, and we have the insight that one can employ from different subfields. And you can try and put it all together to make progress and answer uh, some of the fundamental questions that we have. So these, as I've stated chronologically here, so you've probably seen um, this kind of timeline. And I put in my very own favorite questions here, uh, which is when, when the nuclei collide at very, very high energies as, as of the LHC, what are the relevant degrees of freedom in the wave functions of the nuclei? So the nuclei are very complex objects. So what is it that really is picked out? Uh, what are the quantum modes that are relevant in such a collision? Uh, how is the entropy generated in the overlap with the nuclei? Um, are there universal features of the non-equilibrium violent dynamics that I mentioned? And eventually, how does thermalization occur? Um, it's a process. How do we understand transport uh, in this nearly perfect fluid? And, and eventually, how does the system hadronize uh, and, and, and form the particles that go into your detector? Uh, can can everyone hear me, Siddharth? Is it is it clear? Yes, yes, it's clear to me. Okay, okay, good. Okay, okay. I just wanted to make sure. Okay, so um, so there are, uh, as I said, it's a very difficult problem, uh, and that shouldn't be underestimated. Um, and we have, to the best of my knowledge, only two clean uh, theoretical approaches to this problem, which are uh, which are ab initio. And the first of these is what is often called holographic thermalization. Um, and the paradigmatic example of this is the so-called ADS-CFT duality, uh, which is a duality between um, weakly coupled gravity. Um, so this is classical gra gravity in a 10-dimensional space of which five are curled. So that's the S5 into, uh, into a little ball. Uh, and then there are five uh, flat directions which are, go as, which are in anti sitter um, anti sitter space-time, uh, five-dimensional space-time. And this duality between gravity in, in, in this, uh, on this manifold and uh, a conformal field theory um, in, in uh, which is supersymmetric Yang-Mills, um, um, uh, which, is, which is n equal to four, okay? So in which you, we have uh, n supersymmetric, n equal to four supersymmetric charge. Uh, and this, Strongly coupled theory is uh, has g squared the coupling times n c going to infinity, and n c going to infinity. Okay, so in this particular limit, this strongly coupled theory in four dimensions, uh, which is Susie Yang Mills, is dual to classical gravity in this ten dimensional space time. Now, this is clearly not the right theory. This is not QCD. Um, it has other degrees of freedom which are not there in QCD. However, uh, it's a strongly coupled theory which has many of the features that QCD does, um, especially in the infrared um, for soft physics. Uh, and these features may be universal. So studying such, such a theory might give us valuable insight into strongly correlated QCD in regimes where QCD is, is difficult to access. So examples of these are uh, transport coefficients and hydrodynamics far from equilibrium, um, which you may have heard of in other contexts. Um, and so this is a very useful theory, but you shouldn't confuse it for actually being the actual theory of what happens um, in, in Tamiyan experiments. It's very valuable, but limited. Uh, the other ab initio approach that's very clean is that of QCD at very high occupancy, so where the occupancy F is much greater than one. So there's very, num very large number um, of, of degrees of freedom per mode, um, but the coupling is very weak. So the coupling G goes to zero. However, G squared times F, the occupancy is of order one. Okay, so this is a particular limit of QCD, which is highly occupied but weakly coupled. And in this theory, you can compute uh, very strongly correlated dynamics. So this seems 
uh, counterintuitive because you say it's very weak coupling, but the large occupancy actually c compensates with the weak coupling. So the effective coupling in the theory is strong, but one can still do computations because G is small. Now, um, one can compute a lot of things, and I'm going to talk about that. Uh, but this is also not the limit in which you have the experiments live. The coupling is, is, is finite. Um, it may be relatively weak, but it's still finite. And so how does one extrapolate from this very weak coupling limit, which is strongly correlated, to the actual uh, experiments um, requires phenomenological extrapolations, which are not fully understood. So there may be non-trivial uh, physics going on in that extrapolation that we don't fully understand. These limits are very clean. You can do systematic computations, but how they relate to experimental data is 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 un, is not unambiguous. Um, and and in all of this, one is trying to understand universal features of the dynamics which will survive such extrapolations, either from the wrong theory to the right theory, or from very weak couplings to physical couplings. Uh, and these universal features are uh, things like non-thermal fixed points, the phenomenon of hydrodynamization. Uh, and what's valuable from on trying to understand universal features is that they have they may have powerful interdisciplinary connections. Uh, so for example, cold atomic gases, uh, which are some of the coldest matter in the universe, are uh, if you prepare them with the right boundary conditions, then their dynamics, which you can study in tabletop experiments with high precision, can tell you about some of the features of this very violent, hot um, data that you see in, in the experiments. So that's actually a remarkable thing that uh, universality across energy scales may also provide insight into some of the phenomena that we see. So that this is always to be kept in mind that in some sense, this slide is my, you know, caveat emptor. So, uh, I mean, so, so you know, just be beware uh, what you're buying in the sense that we, the phenomenological extrapolations have to be done on everything that I'm going to be talking about. So, okay, with this in mind, let's ask the question of how do we understand the nuclear wave function in very high energies? Um, so, in, in strong coupling physics, uh, this is very hard to understand. Um, I think um, if you try to understand this as an ADA CFD, some of the answers you get are um, interesting, but very far from what we know from, from data. Uh, so the only approach that really works at the initial is that very weak coupling. And, and that has a long history. That is the essence of the parton model in, in QCD, which is extremely successful. Uh, and, and the way to think about it is the following. So what you think of is a proton or a nucleus um, really depends on how fast it's moving and what the scale is at which you resolve it. So that, so how fast it's moving is how, and its resolution scale is, you know, how deeply you look within uh, the nucleus or, or proton. And that's given by the momentum transfer squared q squared so one over q squared so if you have a proton which is at low energies um, and that's sometimes um, represented by large x which is the number of degrees of freedom so so at very low energies you can think of the proton as three quarks each of which carry uh, some large fraction of the proton's momentum uh, so these are your valence quarks they they have the quantum numbers that make up the proton. Um, now, in 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 quantum field theory, these are not just classical objects. So they have quantum fluctuations that continually dress these valence quarks. So there are fluctuations of gluons in and out of the vacuum that kind of dress these these quarks. Now, what happens is when you boost these this proton to very high energies. What happens is these quantum fluctuations, which are gluons, or they can be quark-antiquark pairs that are produced from the gluons, they start to live longer and longer. So that's time dilation 
uh, that we know from special relativity. So, so now if you're trying to resolve the proton in very short time scales, the boosted proton to the probe looks very different from that of a proton at rest. In other words, all these quantum fluctuations which were addressing the proton and making it up, they start to become accessible to the probe. E, not just the three valence quarks, but it'll see a large number of these gluons and C quarks. And that's a simple explanation of this plot that you see on the right here, which you've often seen perhaps in talks, of parton distribution. So these are parton distributions as a function of the momentum fraction carried by each of the constituents of the proton. And if you, so if you're at large x, what you'll see is mainly the valence quarks. So these are the up and down quarks. They carry the quantum numbers of the proton and they really peaked at large values of x. But there's, it's very unlikely to find valence quarks carrying a very small momentum fraction of the proton. On the other hand, as I said, what you'll see is a very large number of gluons and C quarks. So these C quarks sort of produce some fluctuations of the gluons into quark and anti-quark pairs. And so if you, if you measure at some fixed resolution Q squared, which is large, uh, you're going to see this curve like that. So what this curve is telling you is that the proton can occasionally fluctuate not just into three quarks, but three quarks plus a very large number of gluons and C quarks. And that's what you're seeing at very short resolutions in, in, uh, when you take a snapshot of a proton. So that's what this plot means. So you look at this plot and it doesn't mean anything, but then you try and understand it within this picture and it makes complete sense. And so what's going on um, somewhat more mathematically is that you can ask yourself the question, how can I produce more and more gluons? Isn't that suppressed by the coupling? Because each time you produce a gluon, there's a penalty factor of the coupling constant, which is small. So how come I can produce these many large numbers of gluons? And the answer is that, is that there's a very large phase space that you open up when you produce more gluons. And in QCD, because gluons have vector interactions, these produce logarithmic phase space factors. So, so each penalty factor that comes with alpha s is accompanied by a logarithm from the phase space integrals. And that log can go as, say, 1 over x at small x. So if x is very small, if it's 10 to the minus 3, this log compensates the penalty factor from the coupling. And that's the number of order 1. So that's why you can produce copious gluons. So that's the reason why you see all these tens of thousands of particles in the least detector is because of the simple fact that QCD is a vector theory and the phase space uh, of, of, of particle production compensates for the alpha S suppression, making you able to produce lots and lots of particles. Now, the question you can ask is, okay, this is a, what's sometimes called a Markovian process, which is known in many areas of of, of nature, uh, that is the change in the number of gluons depends on the number of gluons that existed in the previous step in its evolution. So the question is, can this Markovian growth be constrained in some way? Is there a maximal, um, is there a limit to this growth that I show here? Does this growth end at some point? Uh, and, and the answer in QCD is a yes. Um, and this is a phenomenon known as gluon saturation. And what it says is that if you have, if you're, again, as I mentioned, what the proton is depends on, this, on the resolution of the probe. Uh, and so if you're at low energies, you're going to see the three valence quarks, maybe a few gluons floating around. And they're of the size of the inverse of the, uh, the probe size. So now if you increase the energy, if you boost the proton, and, and you look at a transfer section of the proton as it's coming at you, then, as I said, the number of gluons starts to grow, and it grows and grows and grows. At some point, they start to get very close to each other in phase space. So the number of gluons per unit momentum, per unit volume, becomes large, becomes a number which, it turns out, can be maximally only 1 over alpha s, where alpha s is the coupling, uh, the fine structure constant in QCD. So, and that, so the theory tells you that it must have a maximal occupancy. Otherwise, 
the theory is unstable. So the stability of QCD, the stability of nature, right, on the, on the nuclear scale requires that gluons must have a maximal phase speed. They cannot just grow indefinitely. At some point, they, they start to, um, they, you would violate something fundamental, the stability of, of, of nature. And so another way of saying it is, so the, you, can, okay, you can ask yourself, what, how does that happen? Uh, and that's a very interesting problem, is that the gluons are charged particles. So even though they are massless vector gauge bosons, they carry a charge, which is called color. And because of this color charge, they can sort of interact with each other, and they can recombine and screen their color charges. And it's this dynamical process that ensures that they maintain this bound of maximal occupancy, that they don't exceed it. Okay. Uh, and this phenomenon is, of course, called gluon saturation. And in the process of doing so, of trying to respect this bound, develop an emergence scale okay, in this process. So if you, if, if because of all the screening recombination, uh, and that you can have of, 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 of these gluons. And this scale at very small values of x, so when the proton fluctuates, into a configuration which contains large numbers of gluons, each containing uh, momentum fraction x, scale is, is, can be a very large scale and can be much larger than the scale of confinement in QCD, which is lambda QCD. So this is the largest scale in the problem. The coupling must run as a function of this scale. So this is a property of QCD. Sometimes goes under the term tra dimensional transmutation. And, uh, and, and that, in, in combined with the asymptotic freedom of theory, pro provides a weak scale for you to really look into this very dense many-body system. Okay, so even though the system is extremely dense, the coupling between the individual objects in it is weak, and therefore you can try and study its properties. Another way of looking at this is, is, is given by this plot here. Uh, where on the y-axis I've part of the boost, so that's the log of the energy, if you like, the momentum transfer of the probe, um, whereby it resolves what's going on inside the nucleus. And so if you, so the statement is that if the probe has a fixed resolution, which is large, so it's looking at very short distances, then as you increase the energy, no matter how small the objects it will always reach maximal occupancy at some value of, of x. Okay, so, so if you start at low resolutions, the blobs are bigger, and then it'll very quickly reach saturation at some value x, right? And so there's always a critical value at which the occupancy becomes of order one. So f is order one over alpha s, right? Uh, I used n in the previous slide, but sorry, I'm switching to f here, the occupancy. Um, and it turns out that, and this is essentially, this Q for given X is what is Q, Q of S, Q, uh, QS, okay? So that's how you can think of QS as a value of the resolution scale at a given X at which the occupancy is of order one over alpha S. Now it turns out that this is also the boundary where the theory unitarizes, okay? And this is a very interesting thing, which I'll, I'll come back to shortly what I mean by that. Okay, now um, it turns out that uh, in, in QCD, in addition to, to changing X, so to change X, to go to smaller and smaller values of momentum fraction, to see larger and larger fluctuations with more particles, you have to go to higher and higher energies. But it turns out that there's a way around it also, which is by increasing the nuclear size. So if you increase the size of the nucleus, you also are sensitive to the saturation scale. And the reason is as follows. If you have a probe of some size, R per, so it's a virtual photon, say, fluctuates into some quark antiquark pair and scatters of the nucleus, then the size of the quark antiquark pair is 1 over Q, right? That's the resolution scale. And so if this is a small probe and it's much smaller than the size of the nucleons in the nucleus, then as I boost the nucleus to very high energies, what the probe sees is this pancake. Okay, this Lorentz contracted pancake. And so the probe cannot resolve the front or the back end of the nucleus simultaneously. Uh, and that's of size 
uh, a to the one third. That's the length a to the one third, which is the radius twice the radius of the nucleus. And so the saturation scale then increases also as a to the one third. So the probe can't resolve the color either from the front or the back of the nucleus. So it sees this entire color chart squared simultaneously. Even though individual colors can cancel, it sees the color chart squared as a to the one third. So the saturation scale will grow as a to the one third. So not only does it increase with increasing energy, it also increases with increasing nuclear size. And this is one of the motivations for the electron ion collider, which we're going to build at Brookhaven uh, at the end of the decade. So it's already been approved for construction. Uh, and, and this tells you, uh, this plot tells you or illustrates what I was saying, which is that at HERA, which was the previous electron proton collider, which had a higher energy than the electron ion collider. Um, the saturation scales probe were relatively small compared to lambda QCD, uh, the confining scale. And so all the interpretations of saturation from HERA were somewhat ambiguous in that regard. Uh, however, at the EIC, because you have large nuclei like gold that they scatter from, the saturation scale, because it grows a to the one third, can be significantly larger. It can really go out into the perturbative regime of several GeV squared for the highest EIC energies. That's around 100 uh, GeV or so, 90 GeV per nucleon. So this is kind of one of the motivations for the electron ion collider to really try and understand whether this phenomenon of saturation really occurs as, as I have briefly described. Now, um, somewhat more mathematically, uh, the way to understand what I was, I'm talking about is to so imagine now the probe, which is at the bottom. Uh, so it's a virtual photon, say, coming from an electron, and that fluctuates into some quark-antiquark -quark pair called a dipole. It's colorless, right, because it comes from a virtual photon. And this can scatter now a very fast hadron or nucleus at high energies. Now, the nucleus, as I mentioned to you in my previous slides, is not just three quarks, but it contains a large number of gluons, which can then recombine and, and screen each other and so on. It's a very complex many-body object. And so the dipole probes this complex many-body object. Now, it's a very, very difficult problem from first principles in QCD because you know, just think about the number of degrees of freedom one has to handle. However, it turns out that there's an effective field theory uh, of QCD whereby one can understand this process more similarly. And it relies on something that we all know from the first year of quantum mechanics, which is the same physics that tells you why when you study the hydrogen atom with the electron going around the proton, you can ignore the motion of the, uh, sorry, electron going around the nucleus of the proton, so, I mean, the, the proton nucleus, sorry. Um, you can ignore the motion of the proton because the proton is, you know, nearly 2,000 times heavier than the electron. And that was something that Born and Oppenheimer uh, deduced that when you have a very heavy object, uh, you, can, you can ignore the motion of the proton and try to understand the atomic spectra in terms of the motion of the electron itself. Similarly, in QCD, because the large X valence modes are very heavy, they move at the speed of light. They can be thought of as heavy modes um, in, on the light front. Uh, then you can treat their dynamics as essentially static dynamics. You know, they're like the, the proton in the hydrogen atom. While the dipole and the soft gluons uh, are the are the what make the interaction of the electron with the probe uh, when you're looking at say the spectra of the hydrogen atom. So it's these soft gluons which are dynamical degrees of freedom which you treat in full generality. Okay? And that's the essence of the CGC is that the CGC says you can treat very fast energetic modes as static heavy modes. And the the lighter soft gluons you can treat as dynamical modes in full QCD. And the, the connection between the two is described by something called a renormalization group, where you can change what you call heavy and light in some systematic way. Okay. Now, because the occupancy of these modes is so large, the theory becomes classical. Okay, so 
Uh, you might have heard about the correspondence principle in quantum mechanics, which tells you that when the occupancy of modes is very large, they can effectively be described as classical systems. Okay? That's why our dynamics uh, on our scales is classical, right? We are macroscopic objects in quantum, in quantum physics. And so the correspondence principle applies. Similarly, the dynamics of all of these very large numbers of soft gluons collectively can be thought of as classical. Okay? And that's a huge simplification that helps us in trying to understand heavy ion collisions. Now, in this effective field theory, um, of course, I don't have time to go into it. But the, the whole idea of an effective field theory is that you should be able to compute systematically in that theory with much greater efficiency than in the original theory. Um, and in the appropriate limits, you should be able to connect to the original theory. Okay, so that's the definition uh, or essentially a requirement for having an effective field theory. And so similarly, in this effective field theory, the color glass, you can compute all these many body correlations that I show here that look incredibly complex, very efficiently and systematically, just as in condensed matter physics. And the physics actually turns out to be two plus one dimensional. So even though we're talking about a three plus one dimensional world, the dynamics of the gluons and the correlations are essentially on a flat two-dimensional transverse plane. Okay? And the one here is that of the energy or boost. So as you vary the boost, you can understand how these, how these fluctuations change and the correlation lengths and so on. So that's a beautiful thing that you can compute. In fact, what we find is that you can derive actually an equation of how this dynamics changes with energy. Just like in condensed matter physics, you'd like to understand how dynamics changes when you change external control parameters, um, the magnetic field, for example. Similarly, by changing the boost, you can, you can study how these gluon correlations change. Okay? And that's described uh, in this CGC by a nonlinear equation, which is called the boltzky kafchagov equation that tells you how this dipole probe evolves in energy. And, what, and this is where the physics of unitarization comes in. Because what we learn is that just as the maximal occupancy is one over alpha s for the theory to be stable uh, of these soft gluons, that is exactly equivalent to the statement that the dipole that's scattering off these soft gluons has a probability one to scatter with these soft gluons. Okay, that means the cross section unitarizes, it has maximal. Uh, in probability for scattering, okay? And, and this occurs precisely at the point where the occupancy becomes one over alpha s. And that's what we learned from this equation. And this equation is a really beautiful nonlinear equation. Uh, and it turns out that if you look at the dipole correlator, uh, which scatters all these soft gluons as a function of momentum as plotted here, you see it looks like a kind of solitonic wave here where the maximum of this wave is given by the saturation scale uh, at some initial energy. Now, as you evolve the, the system, as the dipole is boosted more and more relative to the hadron, this soliton moves outwards, okay? So this dipole correlator moves outwards, and that's telling you that the saturation scale is becoming bigger and bigger. So one can quantitatively compute how the saturation scale evolves with energy or with X. Now, this again has a very powerful interdisciplinary connection, and that's to something called the fischer kolmogorov reaction diffusion equation. That's known from many subfields, in particular in statistical mechanics. And people have used this synergy to actually use information that we have learned in statistical mechanics to try and apply it to high energy QCD. So if you're interested, you can contact me. I can give you the relevant references on this whole burgeoning body of literature on that. Now, it turns out that there's also a very powerful renormalization group picture, uh, which is based on the ideas of Wilson and Kadanoff and others, uh, where you can actually write down an equation, not just for the dipole functions that you can have, uh, where, you, where, the, where the probes or more complicated probes can understand the structure of the hadron. Okay? And you can do that as a function of energy, so it has tremendous predictive power. 
So one of the uh, the state of the art in the CGC is to perform this, these calculations to higher and higher precision. Uh, and people have now gone to next to leading order, next to leading log kind of accuracy and, and even proceeding beyond. But the attractive thing is some of these infrared features, soft gluon dynamics may actually be universal across energy scales, uh, as, as I will mention. So now let me come to uh, sort of with this at hand, which is how do you understand heavy ion collisions from first principles? Okay. And so this is, of course, a quest that goes back uh, a long time ago. Uh, and, and it was actually articulated uh, very nicely by T.D. Lee uh, in this little uh, poem that he wrote, which says, nuclei as heavy as bulls through collisions generate new states of matter. And Lee and his collaborator, uh, John Carlo Wick, um, in the early 70s had, had this idea that somehow through nuclear collisions, you could create novel metastable states of matter uh, with, with uh, interesting symmetries, uh, which would eventually then decay into ordinary matter. And one could use uh, heavy ion experiments to try and understand them. Now, um, this, this uh, matter has a lot in common with what happened in the early universe. So the process of thermalization of this matter um, is, 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 uh, is very analogous in some ways to uh, the dynamics of the early universe. Now, you may have heard of the fact that, okay, in the early universe, we had a quark gluon plasma, uh, which is similar to what we have in heavy ion collisions. But the analogy goes even further. Um, and what can really make sometimes a one-to-one -one map would be in the very early time dynamics uh, of matter in the Big Bang and what's happening in our Little Bang. Uh, in, in, in heavy ion collisions. Uh, and, and the analogy is as follows. So initially in the Big Bang, you had the, the standard picture is that you had a, a classical field called an inflaton, which has a very high occupancy. It goes as one over the coupling uh, in, that, in that scalar theory. Um, and that's exactly analogous to the fact that in a heavy ion collision, you produce a very high occupancy state the color glasses form a very high occupancy state of occupancy one over the coupling, one over G squared. Um, and that's called the glasma field uh, in heavy ion collisions, high occupancy state. Now, that's not the end of the analogy because what happens then, how does this inflaton field become thermal? And, and the way, the, our best understanding of that is that within the inflaton field, there can be small quantum fluctuations that occur around this classical field. And these fluctuations become large. Uh, and the phenomenon is really like parametric resonance, right? So that's this picture that if you, if you all stand on a bridge and you jump on it, if you get the right resonance, the bridge can collapse because you amplify uh, all the kicks that you're giving it um, to the bridge. And so that's parametric resonance. And it's this phenomenon of parametric resonance that causes small quantum fluctuations to grow and become as large as the inflaton field. And it's the interaction between these fluctuations and the classical field in the early universe that is conjectured to lead to thermalization of the early universe at the gut scale. Um, and that eventually then further cools and forms the quark gluon plasma. Uh, similarly, in the, in, in the plasma, you have an explosive amplification of small momentum modes, okay? Uh, and that is not parametric resonance as in a scalar theory, but it's in a Weibull instability, just like in, in electromagnetic plasmas. So the kinds of things you would have in a tokamak, for instance, um, is, is a kind of instability that occurs because you have charged um, vector gauge fields. Um, and it's this explosive amplification which then interacts with the plasma and leads to thermalization. And this we can actually now show quantitatively, as I will, I will demonstrate. And there are other common features between the early universe, turbulence, topological defects, and so on, which I, I will allude to briefly. Um, and actually, I'll show a couple of slides on each of these, but I won't go into greater detail. So if you now think, OK, now I have this very violent heavy ion collision. I produce all these gluons. 
Um, initially, what you have, as I mentioned, is these very high occupancy classical fields. That's the leading description. And they're lumpy. They're the size, they have some lumpy structure on the order one over QS. And so this is an actual simulation. This is not just a cartoon. It's an actual simulation of, act, of Young Mills fields that it has this kind of lumpy structure. Now, when they collide, what happens is the valence modes that carry the quantum numbers, uh, the so-called spectator quarks and nu nucleons, they kind of go off on the light cone. Okay, so they go off in this X plus direction and they go off in the X minus direction, right? They go through each other. And sometimes that's called a leading particle effect in, in high energy collisions. The soft gluons, right? The small X modes that I've mentioned, which are, they actually collide and they are what form the matter. And that's that central rapidity. So if you're sitting in Elise, you're sitting around here and this is what you're seeing, okay? So it's a beautiful illustration of the parton picture of QCD is precisely what you see in the Elise experiment. Okay? And that's something to, we take it for granted, but it is remarkable. Okay. Uh, while in Elise, you see that the p-bar to p-ratio is of order one in the experiment. And that's just telling you that all the valence degrees of freedom just went to the fragmentation regions of your detector. It's a, another beautiful illustration, right from the bulk spectra of the Elise data that you have this picture going on. Okay. Now, okay, so this very complex collision of nuclei then is the collision of two lumpy gluon fields. Okay. And that's given to you at leading order by solving what's called the Yang-Mills equation. So these are the QCD analog of Maxwell's equations that you study in electrodynamics for the, for the field strength tensor. Uh, and you have sources. So the sources are the color charges, as I mentioned, which are static and they go off along the light cone uh, and they interact uh, with the soft gluon fields through equations like Maxwell's equations. And these color charges have a size scale, which is given by the saturation scale. So the correlation length is the screening length of these color charges is precisely the saturation scale. So that's the only scale in the problem besides the nuclear size in this picture of heavy ion collisions, which is remarkable. You have this very complicated system and it's described fundamentally by just two scales, the size of the nucleus and the saturation scale inside the nucleus. Okay. Uh, and there's a model, the IP Glasma model, um, that was alluded to previously, which in addition to hydrodynamics, gives a very nice description of all the bulk data that you see at both RIC and the LHC. And this is work I did with Subhashish's student, uh, Prithvish Trivedi, uh, and my colleague Bjorn Schenke uh, about eight years ago, which then resulted in the IP Glasma model. So I have to thank Subhashish for uh, putting Prithvish in touch with me. And we have written uh, many papers since, um, in, both uh, on the IP plasma model and its combination with hydrodynamic. So, so, but if you just talk about the IP plasma, which is just the collision of these Yang-Mills fields to leading order, because the, the sources are delta functions, they're pancakes, these nuclei that are colliding are pancakes, they're Lorentz contracted on the light cone. So they have delta functions in X plus and X minus, one going this way, the other going the other way in the light cone. Because of that, the dynamics turns out to be two plus one Ds, boost invariant, okay? So it's independent of rapidity, which is a variable I'm sure you all know about. Uh, and so initially the dynamics is very lumpy on this QS scale. Uh, in fact, I had a movie in PowerPoint which shows you how this lumpiness kind of goes away. But you can see in, if you look at this, I plot the um, color um, magnetic and color electric field squared in the launch journal and Z directions. Uh, and you see initially the EZ and BZ are what are large. Uh, and then over time, they become equal to the uh, transverse electric and magnetic fields. Okay? And in terms of the pressure, what that tells you is that at very early times, the pressure in the system is actually negative. Okay, there's a minus one here at very early times. And what that's telling you is that the, the gluon modes are just initially just free streaming through each other. So the pressure in a fixed slice and rapidity 
was actually decreasing. But then the interactions come in, the interactions of the yang mills modes comes in, and eventually they kind of become equal to each other. But still, in this leading order description, the pressure goes to zero. So the longitudinal pressure is zero, and all the pressure in the system is initially transverse. It's explosive in the transverse direction. So now I come to how does the system become thermal? Okay, how does thermalization occur in such a system? Um, and the way to understand it is first to look at a simpler theory. So think of a scalar phi four theory, um, you know, which is a very much simpler theory. It's like the inflaton theory that one has. And so imagine that, like I said, that you have a boost invariant classical field. That's a phi classical. Okay, so that's a leading order. Now imagine that there are some small fluctuations around this classical field which are random Gaussian nature. So this is a Gaussian random variable whose expectation value is zero, um, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's, mo it's, it's fluctuations is just given by some number here, okay? Uh, and you can decompose these modes into, into plane waves. These are Hankel functions. Uh, and the dynamics is entirely controlled by the small fluctuations in transverse dimensions which satisfies what's called a small fluctuation equation of motion, okay? So these are quantum fluctuations about the classical field in a scalar phi four theory. And now with this simple model, you can actually compute the energy density and the pressure of the scalar field. So if you just compute the energy density and pressure of this classical field, the energy density is given by this line here, okay? So that's T naught naught over three, okay? While the pressure is just like this fluctuating green line here, okay? That's just the pressure of this classical field. And this is in zero plus one dimensions I have for simplicity, okay? Now, if I now include these quantum fluctuations, okay, and then I average over the quantum fluctuations, what I then find is something dramatically different is that these fluctuations and the pressure very quickly kind of go away and they approach, the pressure approaches the energy density over three, okay? So you get an equation of state. And so, so quantum fluctuations, what they do is they actually decohere this classical field. The classical field is a highly coherent object. They decohere the modes inside the classical field. And then that leads to something like an equation of state. Okay? Now, in the language of dynamical systems, which you may have heard of in statistical physics, you can characterize a field and its time derivative on something called a Poincaré plane. Uh, that's a plane in phase space of the field and its time derivative. Start with some initial condition, which is this yellow blob. What you find is that the dynamics of phi and d phi by dt as a function of time of the scalar field. So at different times, that's given by this kind of um, uh, purple curve, the blue, and eventually it fills up this 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 window here, this this, this ellipsoid, and that's essentially a constant energy surface. Okay, so o o very quickly it satisfies this, and that's the Liouville theorem essentially that you fill up this space with very quickly, you get an ergodic system, and so in this process we have shown explicitly that the quantum modes satisfy kind of eigenstate thermalization. The quantum modes then, uh, they kind of thermalize in the sense of occupying the space space equally. And this was a conjecture due to Michael Berry, and it was subsequently developed by Shrednick and others, and they understood it as kind of an essential feature for thermalization of a quantum fluid. And this is something we worked out uh, also in a paper um, many years ago. Now, amazingly, for a more complicated system like the quark-gluon plasma, even though we cannot write a Poincaré plane for this many-dimensional system, it's, it's too, too complicated uh, multi-dimensional system for that. Nevertheless, we find the same phenomenon happening. So you have these classical plasma fields, which are purely transverse. So this is uh, the, in rapidity or wave number, it at, sits at PZ equal to zero. But then you have transverse momenta in these modes, that's this axis here. And there's some distribution, which is classical plasma fields, okay? 
And now you have these vacuum fluctuations around this classical field, just like I mentioned in the previous slide, I have these vacuum fluctuations. Um, and what happens is there's an instability. Okay? And, and that's like the Weibull instability I mentioned. And what happens is that this instability, it grows exponentially, okay, with the square root of the time because it's an expanding system. So in no time whatsoever from the time scale one over QS, if you wait logarithmically longer in time, log squared of one, one over alpha s, the system becomes fully overoccupied. It has decohered, okay, this classical field has decohered and it has produced single particle modes which create an over, overoccupied system very rapidly, okay? Just one over QS times log squared. And this is actually the result of an actual simulation that we did of classical statistical uh, on, on, a, on a lattice, uh, systems on a lattice of three plus one degluon fields. Okay? Uh, and you can look at this paper for more details. And so what, what then happens, right? So now suddenly I went from a completely coherent classical field, right? Which interacts with quantum fluctuations, just like in the early universe, okay? And it produced a decohered system, okay? Now what? It happens very quickly on a time scale, just logarithmically greater than, okay? That's a few tenths of a Fermi, less than that. Now, there's two dynamics then that then occurs. One is the system is still exploding, right? It's exploding to the vacuum. So basically what the system which you produce, which is overoccupied in PZ and PT in momenta, the system wants to compress it in PZ, it wants to redshift because of the expansion, okay? All the higher momentum PZ modes wanna fly out. So there's a redshift that's occurring. So it wants to squeeze the system away from uh, isotropization. Um, but then now these modes are, which are very many, also want to interact and scatter off each other. Okay, and that scattering will want. So there's a competition. Okay, there's a push and pull. The expansion wants to dilute the system. And the and the interactions slow it down, okay. And this competition, we can also study in our numerical simulations, the three plus one d angles, which includes these quantum fluctuations. And what we find is something remarkable, is that firstly we find that the system can be characterized in terms of single particle distributions, which are functions of pt, pz, and time. But then we find that there are many different possibilities. For the scattering of the system, okay, because of the infrared uh, ambiguities and how we treat the infrared modes in the system. So the system can evolve either as a condensate in infrared or it can, and we find that for many different initial conditions, the system all lies on one curve, okay, and that curve is characterized by something called a non thermal fixed point of a particular nature. So if you have a system which is very violent, okay, an explosive, it's very far from equilibrium. It does not go to equilibrium along this simple path that I outlined here. It actually goes through it in a non-trivial way. It first goes to something called a non-thermal fixed point. And then eventually from the non-thermal fixed point, it goes to equilibrium, okay? And this is something that we discovered as shown, that was discussed in this paper. So what is a non-thermal fixed point? It says that if you have a system which is characterized by PT, PZ, and time, you can rewrite it as an overall time dependence, some overall cooling function, which is characterized by a number alpha, times a stationary distribution, F of S, which is characterized by rescaling PT and PZ at each different time scale, okay? So if you let the system evolve, and then at each time you rescale PT and PZ in the system at, at a certain spatial location, you'll find that you get exactly the same function, okay? And in that scaling process, you, you uncover two more universal constants, beta and gamma, okay? So this is sometimes called a real-time renormalization group, is that the system becomes self-similar and it's only characterized by these universal numbers, alpha, beta, and gamma, okay? That characterizes the dynamics of the system. So this is really a remarkable thing, and we see this in our three plus one D numerical simulations on very large lattices, okay? So this is, 
something for very different initial conditions. So that was really a very beautiful thing. And what this is, is essentially the phenomenon of turbulence. Okay, it's sometimes called weak wave turbulence. Uh, and, there's a, and there's a book which describes this. And the funny thing is that <laughs> there's only volume one of the book in which they promised to publish volume two, but it never appeared. Okay, but um, anyway, this is, uh, this is a very complicated, subtle topic, uh, which may explain why there's no volume two. But anyway, the essential picture is that if you have some large, if you throw a pebble in a pond, what it does is it produces these large eddies, and then they're self-similar, and then these eddies become smaller and smaller eddies, and eventually it dissipates at some scale. And that's captured by this very nice ditty, which says big worlds have little worlds which feed on their velocity and little worlds have lesser worlds and so on to viscosity. So viscosity is, is an ultraviolet phenomenon of short distances, but it's the dynamics in the infrared that is really the universal dynamics that is being reflected by these alpha, beta, gammas. Okay, it's a self-similar behavior. And what we have discovered is a turbulent non-thermal attractor in QCD. Now, that's not the end, because it turns out that this turbulent non-thermal attractor we discovered in the plasma of yang mills fields is truly universal. Okay, what I mean is that even though it's separated from cold atomic gases by 21 orders of magnitude in temperature, it has exactly the same dynamics. So if I, if I take a scalar theory which represents these cold atomic fluids to good approximation, and I put in the same boundary conditions, longitudinal expanding, and I look at the scaling function, this F sub S here that I had, right? It is identical in the two theories, and so are alpha, beta, and gamma, okay? These universal coefficients, okay? And this is something, uh, so this here's plotted the superfluid Bose gas, which is F sub phi, the scaling function, and the gluon distribution in this plasma, and they lie right on top of each other, okay, with exactly the same. And this was really, truly amazing, okay? And this is something that was an editor's suggestion of PRL uh, about five years ago. But my colleagues in Heidelberg have gone even further, and they've actually done experiments in the laboratory, okay, of cold atomic gases, which is a tabletop experiment, unfortunately, Glasma in, in, in heavy ion collision is much more indirect to study, but cold atomic gases, you can actually study. And what they did is they took 70,000 rubidium atoms, okay, created a Bose-Einstein condensate, state, and studied the spin correlations. Okay? Um, and so this is not the expanding geometry of the glasma, but it's a static geometry. So the, the coefficients are different. But what you find is the same kind of self-similar scaling, okay? So you have this alpha and beta now. You don't have gamma because the system is static. Um, and so essentially you're having a cooling function where the system cools, and then you have a, a momentum scale controlled by beta. And you find that if you rescale at different times, uh, this, this Bose-Einstein condensate, you find that they all lie on some curve, and you can extract these alpha and beta coefficients to be these numbers. So what I hope is in the near future, they'll be able to simulate exactly this expanding geometry in such a trap and really test the predictions to see whether the expanding angles is exactly the same as that, that of the uh, cold atomic gases. So this is really a remarkable illustration of universality, and, and it's published in Nature in, in 2018. Okay. So um, I'm kind of running out of time. But I just want to say that um, what one now has in this weak coupling picture is that one has a complete description all the way from the collision of the wave functions, right? The first principles description, all the way to where the system goes to a non-thermal fixed point. And beyond that, it not only goes to non-thermal picks, so it also picks out what is the right kinetic theory description subsequently as a system cools. So there are many different possibilities of kinetic theories, and it picks out the right one, uh, and that's sometimes called bottom-up thermalization. Uh, and, and this is a very complex process from 
subsequently. The system cannot be described classically anymore. You have a process that goes through to thermalization, which is described in this beautiful paper by Bayer, Mueller, Schick, and so on. Uh, and it's a phenomenon which you can think of in terms is a kind of quantum turbulence of the theory, which then leads to thermal equilibrium. What's amazing is that in this weak coupling picture, the entire process of this extremely complicated heavy ion collision can be described in terms of one number, and that's the saturation scale. You can compute right from the start to the end the thermalization time, which is given by one word the coupling to the pi half sense one word qs temperature, which is alpha to the two fifths times qs. Now, what is unknown are these are coefficients that multiply this. So that has to be co computed, and that's a very complicated, difficult problem. But at least parametrically, you get the right kind of behavior. You get the behavior from the initial condition given by the saturation scale. So this is really truly remarkable if you think about it. Such a complicated system at the end, I can tell you what the thermalization time and temperature is in terms of one number. So as I said, this, this um, bottom-up part, I only described this part here. But subsequently, thermalization um, occurs through three stages. You initially have collisional broadening of gluons in the plasma up to some time scale. And then what happens is two to three kind of processes become more and more important. You have uh, inelastic scatterings that take over. And that happens on a, on a larger time scale, which produces then a soft bath of thermalized gluons. And eventually, the system fully thermalizes when the harder gluons in the scale QS, they, they are quenched into the, into the heat bath. The same phenomenon as describes jet quenching and heavy ion collision. So the equations of jet quenching describe the final stage of of um, of mini jet quenching of thermalization here. So it's one to one. It's the same equations. Um, so so to summarize, okay, you have a thermalized bath at some time scale, uh, and you have a thermalization temperature. Now here's an interesting consequence. If you stare at this equation something remarkable strikes you right away. So the coupling in QCD is one over log of QS. Okay, it's a logarithm. So when I plug this log in, the thermization time is log QS to the 5 halves divided by QS. Okay, so when QS becomes very large, as it does at very high energies, okay, or in high multiplicity events, or in very large nuclei, then this thermalization time actually goes to zero. And the reason is that a log, no matter how high a power, can never beat a power law, okay? So log of QS to the 5 halves over QS will always go to zero. So this is the point, is that people talk about CGC and hydro. The point is the CGC leads to thermalization, okay? And in fact, in the very high energy Ray-J limit, where QS goes to infinity, the matter thermalizes almost instantaneously. Okay, and the thermalization temperature is then given also by this QS. So this is a frequent misunderstanding that people have: is that oh, they talk about C CGC versus hydro. the The point is that if the conditions are right, CGC will lead to hydro. Okay, uh, and you can see that immediately by looking at this equation and understanding how alpha s behaves as the logarithm of qs, and the fact that it will never beat this power law. Now, people have done um, uh, very nice simulations. Uh, and uh, that's uh, one example of this is shown in comparison with the least data uh, of this kinetic thermalization, bottom-up thermalization. So what they did is two things in this plot here. So here's shown our scale transformative fluctuations against multiplicity. And what is shown is the data, how this transformative fluctuation scale is a function of n charge. Uh, and in blue is where you have the full IP plasma, Yang Mills, plus kinetic theory, bottom up, that goes by the name compost and then hydro a la music, and then URQMD for thermalization. That's the full kind of picture here. And then what's shown is the red 
without the bottom-up thermalization part. So just IP Glasma directly matched to music and URQMD. And you see that for very high multiplicities, uh, the bottom-up Glasma part, uh, the kinetic theory part, doesn't play a big role, right? But then as you go to slower and lower multiplicities, as you would expect, they diverge, right? And the data somehow, you know, I mean, they haven't fine-tuned the comparison to the data, but it, it tells you that in principle, you can distinguish between having this kind of kinetic dynamics in the plasma uh, plus hydro or without. So this is kind of very interesting and hopefully with more fine theory and, and experimental data, you can kind of even extract quantitative numbers for some of these things here. Now, the other interesting plot that I want to bring to your attention since small systems is a big uh, topic in Elise and in other experiments uh, at colliders is, is a plot of 8RS versus in charge, which is which is drawn from this kind of bottom-up thermalization picture of the plasma. Okay, and um, what you see is this 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 line here, this curve, is tau hydro over R to be one. Okay, so in other words, if tau hydro is is less than R, okay, then you know that the system likely thermalized, right? If if the Hydronamization, the thermalization time is less than the size of the system, it's more likely to form a thermalized uh, system. Um, and on the other side is if it's much greater than one, if it takes much longer to thermalize than the lifetime of the system, then the system it never becomes thermal, right? I mean, that's kind of an obvious thing. So you see that this now, on this, using these simulations and so on, you see 8RS here plotted as, as the ND charge, right? So these are some of the typical values. So in a lead-lead collision, you find that because the size of the system is so big that the system thermalizes, uh, is, can be described by hydro for really a very large number of centralities and, and, and collision and number of particles produced. However, as you go to the smaller systems, you see that it's dominated more by the initial state, okay? So that you can have, if you go to higher multiplicities, you get into the hydro regime, but it's a smooth continuum, okay? So from the larger to the smaller systems, you see kind of a smooth continuum. And that's what these kinds of combined simulations are telling us. And so we are now in a very nice position because of this tremendous amount of data and the much more refined money, many stages in this weak coupling uh, CGC plus IP Glasma plus uh, compost uh, plus music and RQMD picture, we're really now able to fine tune the various elements to try and fit the data and extract physics. Um, now, another big thing which I didn't have time to go into, which is also a burgeoning field, is a statement that, uh, or the understanding that has developed that you don't really need um, the system to thermalize for hydrodynamics to be applicable. And people have shown this in, in model studies based on simple you know, uh, holographic systems um, to kinetic theory and so on, where you see that you know, even though the system um, has some very kind of chaotic behavior at very early times, if you plot it in the right variables, um, which is sometimes called the hydronamization variable, the effective temperature divided by ORS, you find that the energy densities of very different systems with very different dynamics, right? Either ADS-CFT or kinetic theory or different kinds of approximations to, to phase space densities, they, they all kind of converge to the hydro curve. Uh, at fairly early times, okay? So in some, and then there's some universal behavior that goes on well before the system approaches actual thermal equilibrium. So, so what this tells you is that even if the system is very far from equilibrium, the hydrodynamic equations interpreted properly can be applied, okay? So that's one lesson that we learned. Um, the other thing that you learn from these, these kinetic uh, plus IP plasma simulations is that this hydronamization process happens even before chemical uh, equilibrium, 
and for thermal equilibrium. Okay, so that's given by these different time scales. And that's what's plotted here. You find that the hydronization where these curves converge occurs at very short time scales. And then chemical equilibration occurs. So the number of gluons and fermions in each chemical equilibrium, uh, even though you start out entirely with gluons, fermions are produced explosively and they actually form chemical equilibrium. And then eventually on a longer time scales, the system reaches full thermal equilibrium. But this is telling you that you can apply hydro much earlier, just as the thermological applications of hydro have been telling us for some time, except that you shouldn't use thermal equilibrium equations of state in such models, but something that is far off equilibrium. So um, I'm kind of, I know I'm going over time. We start a little bit late, so I think I'm about 10 minutes over time. If you give me another five minutes, I can tell you um, a little bit more about some other exciting topics. So it's really up to uh, the audience and uh, the audience. I think I think I think you complete it. You you okay. take that five okay. minutes, I, five minutes, and then, okay, yeah. yeah, I can I can definitely be done in, in uh, you know five to six minutes, and and uh, I hope it'll be of interest to you. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, in addition to, for example, studying viscosity and, and um, its correlation with transfer momentum, um, photons, of course, have always been um, a big part of the story. Uh, and of course, uh, the uh, India Alice collaboration has con contributed tremendously to this this uh, part of the um, experiments. Um, and um, the reason is, of course, photons are very sensitive to all stages of bottom-up thermalization, um, including the hydro part as well. And that's both um, that's both uh, a blessing and a curse simultaneously. Uh, what is shown here is a very nice study by um, my former student, Garcia Montero, um, and where he actually had the different contributions from the different stages of the glasma. If you notice, if you recall, I had three stages which was the collisional broadening, the collinear cascade, and the mini jet quenching. Uh, and you see the differential contributions to photon production from each of these. Uh, and then you can sort of compare this to the thermal photons, okay, compared to uh, all of these. Uh, and this is plotted here as a function of the PT distribution. And he was able to achieve uh, a good agreement with the data where you see that the glasma contribution actually is substantial. Okay? Now, there are significant uncertainties in his computation and in the thermal computations which have been carried out. So there's a very nice paper by Charles Gale and collaborators, uh, sang Jeon, Jeon, um, where they actually discuss some of these issues. Um, I, I don't want to go into that, but the point is that there's still a role for these plasma contributions and in one particular model or approach you see that they actually pr produce a very significant fraction of the photons. Um, so the last topic I wanted to talk to about in this last few minutes was about topology okay. um, and this is again something when we were thinking about heavy ion collisions in the early days there was very little thought to that possibility um, but thanks to this beautiful paper by Karzeev, McLaren, Moringa and um, related work, um, this idea came to the fore and it's a big topic, of course, now at STAR and, and, um, and in Elise. Uh, and the basic point is that this remarkable fact that um, when you have semi-central collisions of heavy ions, you produce electromagnetic fields which are very large, right? They can be 10 to the 14 Tesla or 10 to the 18 Gauss, so really very large, some of the largest in nature. Um, and now the insight was that if you now think of this hot matter which was produced, which is experiencing this large magnetic field, then what you can have is that inside this hot matter you can have topological transitions. So what I mean is that the QCD vacuum can be thought of as these multiple minima, which are energy degenerate, and which are characterized by something called a Chern-Simons number. It's a kind of winding that one does in a map 
of the color group to the spatial um, uh, sphere of, of three three dimensions. Um, and so this, this is really the phenomenon of topology. You characterize things vacua in the theory. So this is a QCD vacuum, energy degenerate thing. And so what you can have is the matter is hot enough, you can have fluctuations which allow you to jump between different vacua. Okay? And these are characterized by something called topological charge. So this is a charge just like color charge. Okay, It's a property of QCD. And so you can have different vacua, you can jump to different vacua in this hot matter. And depending on that, it turns out that you can generate this chiral magnetic effect where you flip in a magnetic field the, the momenta um, as opposed to the spins of particles which are aligned along the magnetic field, and that's how you create this current. Okay, That's the chiral magnetic current. But that requires such a topological transition to occur. So this point should be kept in mind. And the whole purpose of studying the chiral magnetic effect is to understand this phenomenon. Okay, that's why it's interesting to understand the hot structure of the QCD vacuum. And now the problem is, of course, as you well know, is that the magnetic field dies off very rapidly okay, in heavy ion collisions. So these large magnetic fields I just mentioned exist for very short time scales of less than a Fermi. So these topological transitions are most important at the earliest times. Okay, that's where the effect is the biggest, and you can create this this thing. So, but this also tells us that the plasma is where all this action is happening. The early times, the coherent classical fields, are what are driving this topological effect. Again, this of course has been seen in condensed matter systems, and indeed we actually see this. Okay, so. So what I show here is these yellow blobs are the, the gauge fields, the gluon fields in the hot plasma, okay? Now what I can do is there's a process called cooling on the lattice whereby I can remove the hottest modes, okay? And so that's shown by I'm going to, I'm cooling to longer and longer times, which means I'm removing all the hot modes in the plasma in plasma. And what's left at the end are really the coolest modes. And what you see is that these coolest modes have integer values of this topological charge. Okay, this is an actual result of a simulation. So you see very beautifully for the very first time that these cooled soft gluon configurations of hot Yang-Mills matter are topological. Okay, they're characterized just like that previous cartoon. They live in different uh, vacua characterized by different topological charge. Moreover, they are lumpy, okay? They are of size one over QS. These cool configurations, they carry integer values of topological charge and they're lumpy on size one over QS. And, and in fact, it's been shown in later simulations that they actually form a kind of Bose condensate with the order parameters given by the string tension, okay? So this is kind of very exciting things. This is non-equilibrium physics that hopefully that one can start to learn about at uh, least uh, in future. And in fact, these topological transitions are characterized by something called a sphaleron transition. So when you go over the barrier, that's what's called a sphaleron transition. So, okay, this object at the top is called a sphaleron, while instantons are tunneling solutions between these different vacua. But because the matter is hot, you can go much more efficiently over the barrier to different churn Simons number or topological charge. And this, this is something that we computed. This Fallon transition rate is extremely large in the plasma at very early times. Okay, so these topological transitions indeed are happening at very early times and with very high uh, rate. Okay, it's given by QS to the fourth. And then uh, we showed that it actually goes down. Okay, and then eventually it reaches a value for sphaleron transitions that had been extracted previously uh, in thermal equilibrium. Okay, so people have computed sphaleron transitions in thermal equilibrium, but we show that it's actually much larger at very early times. And this is what Shuriak and Zahed um, very early on called exploding sphalerons. It's actually confirmed by these numerical simulations. So to summarize, I really apologize for having gone over. Um, so there have been significant developments in our understanding of QCD thermalization in the last decade. 
um, as I hope you'll agree. And they've been driven by significant progress in ab initio theory, as I've tried to uh, outline. Spectacular data from Rick and I to tell you about. And very rich inter interdisciplinary connections, which are continuing to evolve. And I expect the synergy to yield further dividends in the next decade. Um, Nep and questions. Um, as I said, all of this is done in very weak couplings. Um, we are extrapolating to the data. Um, a further outstanding question is the role of entanglement in thermalization. I think this is something that's a topic that's very big in quantum physics, quantum optics, condensed matter, and so on. And I think that will, its importance will grow in this field and where we start asking much more differential questions by what we mean by thermalization rather than just say, okay, hydro or whatever. So we, we're going to really start to ask questions at the level of sophistication her and cold Adam friends are doing. Uh, and if you want to see a paper I've written on this, I've re given you references where we show that entanglement uh, can mimic thermalization in simple systems. Um, I also expect that in a, insight in, in the next decade in in quantum computing so where you can full, put the full theory on uh you can digitize the theory and study it in real time i mean the problem as you know is in qcd is that we can only do euclidean computations at imaginary time and extract things like thermodynamics but real-time quantities which we care about the actual particles that are being produced and evolving and their transport is something that's inaccessible. That's why we have effective theories like CGC and ADS and so on. But we can maybe get around that and actually put the entire theory over a time scale of 10 to 20 years uh, on a quantum computer. Um, what I wonder, in the early 80s, when the whole heavy ion program started, the, the lattice computations were done on four by four lattices uh, four to the fourth lattices and now we have the thermization temperature the the uh, not thermization temperature, the the uh, pseudo critical temperature of qcd to one percent accuracy so it took 35 years but we're there and so maybe in that same time scale we can really simulate the full lhc simulator <laughs> that would be a dream and i've written a paper about this, which i would uh, like to bring to your attention where basically talk in a scalar five four theory of simulating essentially a, a collision. Now, I've only covered also a very small fraction of the activity in thermalization and interdisciplinary connections. And two important emissions include chiral kinetic theory and anomalous transport. And this is something I've also worked on that's uh, in this paper with Mueller. Uh, and also uh, non equilibrium dynamics in the vicinity of a critical endpoint in the QC phase diagram. Uh, and I've worked on this with Shragata Mukherjee and, and Yi Yin, uh, and uh, I suggest you invite one of them to give you one of your future seminars uh, on, on these topics. So, so thank you very much, and apologies for going over. Thank you so much, Raju, for this nice talk. I'm sure there must be questions, although we are running out of time, but if you add, right. <laughs> we can take up some of the questions. Sure. Uh, is it OK? OK, so suggest if you have questions, then to avoid uh, interference, could you put them right in the chat box that you have a question, and then we will take up one by one? So, sorry, uh, can, you, can you repeat what you said? Yeah, I, I, I asked the audience if they have questions, they can just write in the chat box that they want to ask, and then we can take up one by one. Yeah, we have a question from uh, Subhadeep Roy. Please unmute your mic and you can speak, please. Uh, hello, Professor. Hello. Uh, yeah, uh, so thank you very much, first of all. It's my fourth talk that I attended. And uh, each time it was pretty good. So you never, I mean, stop to surprise me so today's talk especially the point that actually i mean seems fascinating to me that uh, whenever we are trying to understand uh, the whole system 
I mean collision system, we basically uh, are down with. I mean, I mean, the, we we are for we have been able to formulate the theory in such a way that uh, we just only need to understand uh, the I mean gluon distribution parameter and uh, the size of the nucleons, right? That, that, that's right. The saturation scale and and right. Ah, yeah, saturation scale. So. Um, I had the problem basically in understanding exactly uh, somewhere you made that this uh, saturation scale has also depend in size of the nucleus, right? Size the, of the, the nucleus. size of the nucleus. Yeah. The size of the nucleus. Yeah. So could you please tell me more about that? Actually, I didn't get yeah. that time. Yeah. So so um, so the the size of the nucleons actually uh, turns out to be less important is, and the point is, uh, I didn't ask to it in detail, which is when you have a probe that's interacting with a nucleus, not a nucleon, then of course it interacts because a very short time scale of this high energy interaction, it simultaneously interacts with, with quarks and gluons from several nucleons simultaneously. Okay, so it cannot tell the difference between a kick that it got from the first nucleon and the last nucleon. They all seem exactly the same because it's an essentially instantaneous interaction. And so the effective scale that it sees is, is the saturation scale in one single nucleon times the number of nucleons that it scattered off. And in a nucleus that goes as eight to the one third. So that's why the saturation scale in the nucleus as seen by a probe is a to the one third that in a, nucle in a nucleon, in a proton. Oh, okay, yes, now it's a little bit clear to me. Now uh, I have the other question, I have a doubt probably uh, that, uh, yeah. So when we are colliding uh, nucleus say, with another probe say, uh, so the saturation occurs the saturations actually occurs at any momentum range, right? I mean, the speed of the projector, if I say, I mean, the particle that is coming to hit the other nuclei. So the saturations actually, no matter what is the momentum of the incoming particle is, so the saturations will always occur, right? So, so the saturation, um, as I said, it's a dynamical scale and it certainly depends on the energy of the collision um so it's it's you can uh formulate it in a boost invariant way you can formulate it in terms of the rapidity of the process and so depending on what the rapidity is the saturation scale will vary okay yes thank you so much okay mm -hmm. yeah thank you sure okay so now next question is by ramani gupta mm -hmm. ramani ma'am could you please uh, ask this question Hello? Am I audible? Yes, Hello. yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir, for a very nice talk. Uh, I have a question related to one of the topics which you uh, discussed, and that is about universality, self-similarity, and turbulence. Uh, Very good. Very good. Yeah. So my question is that a similar proposal and study was proposed around two, three decades back by Bailas and later developed by Rudy and his colleagues uh, that there is self-similarity and universal behavior during the phase transition. And the point that can be seen using the intermittency analysis. Uh, what are your views on that particular uh, proposal? Uh, okay, so, so, so that's, uh, yeah, I didn't get quite the names that you mentioned, but um, the point is, indeed, similarity um, and, and, and uh, more generally than turbulence is, 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 is a widespread phenomenon in, in a lot of areas of physics, and in particular, near a phase transition. So what happens is the critical modes which are often very soft modes, they fall out of equilibrium um, when they're close to critical point becomes, because they become essentially massless. So they so imagine that you have a hydro system which has some soft modes. 
then the soft modes decouple in some sense from that hydro system. Uh, the closer you get to the critical point, this is sometimes called critical slowing down in, in condensed matter physics. And these soft modes, they have some kind of universal behavior um, whereby you can understand them in terms of domains. They form domains. So imagine a system of spins at some high temperature and that's being quenched very rapidly. What happens is that there are domains of spins with particular magnetization, for example, that form, which are different from that of the, you know, the rest of the fluid. And they are self-similar. And this was something that was first noted by Tom Kibble. Um, and it was later used to study topological effects, say, in the early universe. Um, and also then by, by Biotek Zurek. So it's sometimes called, you know, Kibble Zurek scaling. Uh, and it's precisely this scaling that that uh, Shwagata Mukherjee, Yi Yin, and I claim occurs in heavy ion collisions at lower energies near a critical point. So we have a PRL on that from 2016, um, and where we even suggested that one could look for signatures of this in the um, in the BS search. So so indeed, but um, the, I wouldn't necessarily call that phenomenon turbulent. Polarity is kind of the larger question. The system doesn't care about the initial conditions. So, uh, in a way, if I say that uh, I see the fractal structures, so I am very near to see the self-similar behavior in the heavy inclusions. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I personally don't find fractality to be a very useful concept. Um, I don't think it really necessarily comes from some deeper fundamental theory. I would really try to understand it in some time, in some, in terms of the usual picture one has of critical phenomena, where you try to understand it in terms of um, scaling exponents. Um, I, I'm not sure the word or phenomenon fractality by itself is very useful by itself. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we have one more question from Maria. Could you please uh, ask your question? Uh, good morning, sir. Sir, I have a Hello. question that in one of your slides, you mentioned that quantum fluctuation becomes classical because of the high gluon occupancy. My question is, is it the only reason for high, uh, I mean, becoming classical because of the high gluon occupancy or are there some other reasons as well? No, it's 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 just the high occupancy. So it's um, you know it's just a manifestation of the correspondence principle that says that when you have a lot of closed lying states in a system, those closed lying states can be approximated by some average classical distribution. Um, and so this this classical behavior, um, it's a good question. The classical behavior is not just a phenomenon of the dynamics. Uh, in terms of just the equation of motion, but also the charge becomes classical. So what I mean is that of something like spin, right? It's an internal quantum number, and we sum yes. over spins, right? But yes, if you look at a if you if you look at a nucleus with very high spins, as people have studied, then that spin of the nucleus becomes classical. In other words, the jz and jy, the two spins, they commute. Okay, they're no longer equal to IH bar J, JX. They, they commute with each other. And that's, again, because they have high occupancy. So this phenomenon also applies to color charges. When you have a large amount of color charge, then they know the color charges actually commute with each other. So it's classical on two levels. But the basic point is H bar becomes uh, a, a small number effectively okay uh, sir i have one more question you uh, you uh, said this smart cohen growth something like that is it like yes. gluons uh, is it uh, i mean i haven't uh, heard about it is it like uh, the gluons are growing due to the i mean uh, gluons are uh, growing due to the energy it's is it uh, this i mean so 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 markovian so uh, actually describes uh, even 
such very general things like how bacteria grow or or how population growth occurs it's a basically it's basically a simple idea that the change in the number of a population is proportional to the population itself okay so okay. so if you had you know x number of people right then as as a function of time the number of people will grow um and and so the growth in the number of people is proportional to the number that were there previously. So it's the same thing with gluons. So the change in the number of gluons is proportional to the number. And that's basically exponential growth. So okay. like the way the that's how the coronavirus grows, you know, it's it's a Markovian process. Okay. Mostly. Okay, sir. Thank you. I'm done. Okay, so next question by Subhashista. Subhashista, could you please ask? Uh, yeah, hi Raju. I have. Uh, hi, hi. I have one question. Is that from hi. your this uh, thermalization uh, that you have discussed about? Now uh, I have a conceptual problem. Right, is that, right. that it? It means that. Do you hear me? Yes, yes, I do. Yeah, uh, it means that you get thermalization basically from your initial conditions. That means you have uh, plasma, and then that essentially takes you there through the process that you have talked about. Now, uh, does it mean that you don't call uh, final uh, inter state interaction to get it thermalized? If you have a saturation scale, uh, the gluons are saturated, then and uh, heavy ion collisions, it will automatically lead to a thermalization. This is question number one, and related to just just one minute, what will happen at lower energy? When, for example, uh, you don't have so much gluons, but you basically have the quarks, uh, which essentially kind of might have also overlap on that. So, uh, right. Could you, yeah. so, right. So, so okay. So, um, let, let me first let me address the first question. So, again, assume let's take the case where you have very high energies, right? So, LHC qualifies, um, and and so the statement is you no, know, not at all that it's um, the the scattering is very important. My point is that the glasma creates the conditions for large scattering. Okay, so in other words, the because you at higher energies you have such a large number of gluons produced. The, you remember in the CGC, the phase space density of gluons is much higher than in a in hydro. So it's it's a order one over alpha s. Uh, while in a typical Boltzmann distribution in a kinetic system, it's much less than one. So mm -hmm. the occupancy is very, very large. But then what I'm describing is a process whereby once the occupancy gets smaller, then the system starts to scatter more and more and more because you're actually producing on-shell gluons. And it's that process that I've described which leads to this bottom-up thermalization process. But the interesting point is that the the final state that you produce of thermalization does not depend actually on the details uh, or in gory detail about you know what's going on it only depends on this initial saturation scale to first approximation okay that's the dominant effect so it doesn't care about you know precisely how large the occupancy was uh, you know, some of the other details of the dynamics and so on, it really only cares about, um, you know, this large, it's dominated by this large initial scale. So the process, in, so my point was that if you, if you have a CGC and the system is large enough, you will have thermalization. No, but you cannot talk about, let's say, D-gold. That, uh, that you can. You, you can. So, so my claim okay. is that even in PP, okay. so even in PP collisions, mm -hmm. if you go to sufficiently high energies, the system will thermalize. Okay, that's the CGC prediction. Okay, so that's why I I don't like this way people present it as a dichotomy. My claim is that one actually leads to the other. So my claim is that the formulas that I presented tell you that even in the smallest systems. Mm -hmm. like PP, if you go to sufficiently high energies or high multiplicities, then the system mm -hmm. will thermalize. Okay. So it has to because the phase space occupancy is so large mm 
that even though the size of the system is small, the particles will scatter plentifully before they freeze free. So your initial gluons are so many that itself yeah. leads to your saturation, leads yeah, to your you thermalization. Really, you have to really think in terms of phase space density. Okay, I get it. So it's the number of gluons per unit momentum per unit volume becomes very large. And the CGC tells you that initially it's at one, order one over alpha, the coupling, and if alpha is weak, and then the particles, when they finally go on shell, are very close to each other, they have to scatter. Uh, okay. so, so in fact, to CGC from the rest of the stuff, you have to get away from the thermalization, I mean, aspect. You have to try to go to, you know, smaller systems, smaller number of particles produced and so on. So there's a fine tuning there that one has to uncover. Now to come to your second point, the, um, as you go to lower energies, of course, this description breaks down because you cannot, as you said, you cannot think in terms of quark and gluon degrees of freedom as much anymore. You're, you really have hadron dynamics that comes in. Uh, and then the coupling in QCD is no longer small. So all of the assumptions that I'm talking about break down completely. And the problem, because we don't know in QCD for first principles how to handle low energy collisions. It's a much more complicated problem than at high energies. That's the paradox. Okay. And in fact, that's the motivation to go to higher energies. You can say, why do we want to do heavy ion collisions at higher and higher energies via plasma every single time? The point is that the higher the energies you go to, the system is actually cleaner and you can study the stuff that you want to extrapolations much more easily because we have no way in QCD from first principles to treat low energy collisions. Okay, thanks. In the quantum computer. <laughs> that's true. That's that's true. The May, maybe I, I will I'll send you one mail on this, your thermalization, hydro without thermalization because that I have some Something I okay. need to discuss, but that that would be separately. I will write to you separately. Okay, great. So we have to run because I actually had scheduled yeah. another meeting at nine fifteen. I didn't think I would go over this this uh, late, uh, but I'd be very happy to entertain uh, email questions from Pete. So my slides, I guess, will be available also, right, in some some place. Some place. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Siddharth, you may, you may conclude now. Okay, okay so I think. Yeah. Thanks, Raju. Thank you so much for your time and for this long discussion. <laughs> and I, I would like to thank to everyone who joined. And I think we conclude this webinar. And, and, and we would like to have Raju in physic physically in person. Okay, take care. Take care. Okay, bye. Bye, everybody.